So welcome everyone uh, to the public webinar series of the Wilberforce Post Institute. I'm Lorena Rocha and I'll be chairing the session today. Our speaker this evening is Clara Skrivankova. Uh, Clara has over 20 years of experience on contemporary slavery and business and human rights. Uh, she started her, her, her career in the European anti-trafficking network uh, La Strada and worked in several other organizations, including Anti-Slavery International and the Ethical Trading Initiative. She has advised numerous bodies, including the European Commission and the Joseph Rountree Foundation. Currently, she works in the Independent Anti-Poverty Foundation Trust for London and continues to be involved in anti-slavery and business and human rights work internationally. She'll be speaking here in her personal capacity as an independent expert. Before I give Clara the floor, I would like to remind you all throughout her presentation, you can use the question tab on the right-hand side of your screens to write your questions to her. If you much rather take the floor, you can also do that at the end in the Q&A session. Also, a reminder that the webinar is being recorded and might be available on the Institute's YouTube channel at a later date. So let me not take any more time and welcome Clara, who will be reflecting on a decade of anti-slavery efforts uh, in the UK. So thank you, Clara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lorena. And thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. And thanks everybody for joining this afternoon. In 2007, the Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women published a report called Collateral Damage. The report assessed the impact of anti-trafficking measures on human rights around the world using examples from different countries. The title was chosen as the authors felt it conveyed well the experiences to those trafficked with the systems that were supposed to be there to protect them. I wrote the chapter on the UK. Rereading the publication again a few weeks ago, I found that although much has changed, especially in terms of legislation and general awareness, the main conclusions of that report still stand. Mike Dottridge, who has worked in this field for decades and I think might be attending today as well, writes in the preface to collateral damage that the priority for governments around the world in their efforts to stop human trafficking has been to arrest, prosecute and punish traffickers rather than to protect the human rights of people who have been trafficked. Mike also observed that this is an approach consistent with what governments have been doing for two centuries to stamp out slavery, forced labor and slavery-like practices. They have given higher priority, both in international agreements and in national law, to declaring slavery and similar abuse illegal, rather than spelling out how such forms of abuse are to be eradicated or how to safeguard the human rights of the individual who have been subjected to that abuse. That paragraph that Mike wrote 14 years ago sums up well what the UK's response to the issue has been in the past decade. Now, before I consider that response, I will first deal with the term modern slavery. Modern slavery, in fact, does not exist. In law, that is. The Modern Slavery Act, does not have a legal definition of modern slavery, but rather defines its forms that are considered criminal offenses, human trafficking, slavery, forced labor and servitude. The term doesn't exist in international law either. Before the introduction of the Modern Slavery Act in 2015, the UK, like most of the world, talked mainly about trafficking in human beings, a term that became internationally accepted in the year 2000 when the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime was introduced along with its trafficking protocol. To me, the term modern slavery represents two things. One, an umbrella term, a shorthand used to describe the different forms of slavery and slavery-like practices, such as forced labor and human trafficking. And second, a brand, a brand that was created to launch the Home Secretary Theresa May as a contemporary abolitionist and the UK as the power on a renewed abolitionist campaign. The term has caught on largely in other English speaking countries like Australia, but much of the world still speaks about trafficking, forced labor or bonded labor, notions that are defined in international law. In fact, many overseas view the term modern slavery with suspicion and the global north's anti-slavery effort as neocolonialism. Nevertheless, I will use modern slavery when I speak um, and that's for the sake of concision. <clears throat> 
the way that UK tackles modern slavery can be and continues to be um, described as a journey. It started some 20 years ago with a period of denial that it was a large problem in the UK to treating it as a problem of sexual exploitation and immigration, an organized immigration crime. From there, the path was set in which it was described as a heinous crime that can be solved by rescuing victims and apprehending perpetrators. This culminated in the passage of the Modern Slavery Act in 2015 and positioning the UK as a self-proclaimed global leader in the fight against modern slavery. The rhetoric of law and order created a narrative of evil traffickers organized in mafia-like structures responsible for the misery of victims and the state as the positive hero who helps to rescue them and puts the bad guys behind bars. This was posited as one of the distinguishing features between the modern and the old slavery, which, in which the state was complicit. Yet in many ways, there is little modern about modern slavery. While slavery and slave trade are no longer sanctioned by the state and governments have largely prohibited it in law, the underlying causes remain similar. Abuse of power, exclusion from power, discrimination and extraction of profit from abuse of others without very little risk of punishment. And this is coupled with the failure to identify and own up to the fact that political economy creates conditions in which the enslavement of many can continue. While most states today do not directly engage in the enslavement of people, with the exception of countries like Turkmenistan, where the cotton industry is state sponsored system of forced labor, or China that uses forced labor as a tool to ethnically cleanse Uyghur Muslims, governments are still more culpable than they would like to admit. Culpability comes in a form of inaction, failure or complacency. Often, this is because those who are most at risk of enslavement come from marginalized or racialized communities and those disproportionately affected by poverty and inequality. Among those enslaved, women and girls represent a majority of those trafficked for sexual exploitation. In South Asia, Dalits and Adavasis, members of the untouchable caste and indigenous peoples commonly subject, are commonly subjected to forced labor. In Europe, migrants, especially those from countries that are subject to strict immigration control, represent those who are most commonly exploited. Children that are trafficked for county lines in the UK tend to be from the most deprived backgrounds, experiencing poverty and exclusion, often intersexing with race-based discrimination. Global estimates suggest that in today's world, there are some 42 million people in slavery. While most seem to take place in the global south, the profits generated from it are largely consumed in the global north. In the UK, the Centre for Social Justice and others estimate that there could be at least 100,000 victims, well beyond the official government estimate that estimated in 2017 the number to be somewhere between 10 and 13,000. The response in the UK to modern slavery picked up pace in the past decade. There is no denying anymore that this is a serious issue. We have specialist modern slavery teams in police forces, we have an anti-slavery commissioner and a modern slavery unit at the Home Office. Local and national working groups and partnerships have been formed. There are laws in place in all three UK jurisdictions and the UK government and the devolved administrations fund some support to those identified as victims. There are more organisations specialising in supporting victims and campaigning on these issues. The number of potential victims identified every year is rising and there have been some high profile prosecution. I would say that one of the big changes that the UK has seen in the past decade is the public recognition that modern slavery exists here. There is more awareness, not just in the public, but also amongst professionals, and there is an agreement that this shouldn't be acceptable in the UK in the 21st century. However, does that all mean that the UK is close to eradication of modern slavery? There is still a long way to go to achieve that. To do that, I would argue the UK needs to shift its approach and ask some difficult questions about its policies and political economy. And by political economy, I mean the laws, policies and customs that we use to govern businesses, trade, employment and development. The UK continues to focus on fighting criminals 
but less on emancipation and empowerment of victims. One could argue that this is only natural, as the policy sheet chiefly sits with the Home Office, the crime-fighting department, which of course is the same department that has been pursuing the policy of the hostile environment. The dichotomy between good rescuers and evil traffickers absolves governments of responsibility for what has happened and explains modern slavery in simple binary terms. I and many others find this perspective flawed. Criminal justice, of course, plays a role in tackling modern slavery, but we cannot prosecute our way out of the problem. Effective response to modern slavery lies in understanding the complexity of what happens, why and how it happens, and crucially, what the role of the political economy and society is. Our policies and laws determine whether someone is more or less likely to be enslaved, whether they are entitled to protection and how they will be treated. We need to understand and acknowledge the systems that allow the enslavement of tens of thousands of people in the UK to continue. Dealing with modern slavery is not just about crime and punishment, it is also about protecting of rights. Under the European Convention of Human Rights, which is domesticated through the Human Rights Act, the UK has the obligation to protect people from slavery. Protection of victims and prevention of slavery remain the weak points of the UK's response. This was once again shown in a judgment passed just this February by the European Court of Human Rights in two cases involving Vietnamese men trafficked into the UK when they were children and enslaved in cannabis cultivation. The two, known by the initials VCL and AN, were trafficked in the UK when they were teenagers in 2009. In both cases, they were found near or in a cannabis factory, prosecuted and convicted for cannabis cultivation. They were felled by multiple professionals, starting from the criminals, the, uh, the criminal lawyers, the police, the CPS and the judiciary. These all failed to recognize that this was a situation of trafficking and these children, victims of exploitation by traffickers, entitled to protection and assistance by the UK authorities. It took more than a decade from their trafficking to achieve justice and a lot of painstaking work of lawyers who represented them. The Strasbourg Court found that the UK breached their duty under Article 4 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which requires states to prevent people from being enslaved. The, the two who are now um, grown men were each awarded damages of €25,000 for their suffering. This case is indicative of an approach that does little to address the underlying causes of slavery or protect victims. Instead, it exemplifies a system that all too often scrutinizes and even prosecutes victims. Since the year 2000, there has been an internationally recognized formula for combating trafficking or, if you will, modern slavery. Prevention, protection and prosecution. It, also, it is also accepted that these three are key, three key ingredients, and if one of them is missing, uh, this disables effective dealing with, the, with modern slavery. Protection, and even more so, prevention, remain, unfortunately, the weakest links in practical response. Perhaps it is because it is more difficult to make the argument for prevention, as it would require proving that because of our action something did, something did not happen or perhaps it would require more scrutiny of a wide range of policies which might be uncomfortable for the proponents of those policies or simply because addressing modern slavery is not as big a priority in practice as it might sound in statements. To move to closer to eradication the UK will need to start looking at how policies and other rules that govern our society contribute to the risk of enslavement. Unless we address all the reasons why exploitation happens, we will continue to see this revolving door of people being enslaved, often repeatedly. The two areas I believe are critical to look at are the immigration policies and those related to the labour market. Modern slavery, of course, is not a crime of immigration, but of exploitation, but it is linked to immigration systems, as majority of victims are migrants. Although a sizable number, some of the latest quarterly statistics suggest about 35% of possible victims in the UK are British, migrants still lead in the UK statistics. The way a country manages immigration is going to impact on its ability to deal with modern slavery. I would argue, and I'm not alone in this, 
that the policy of a hostile environment is in a direct contradiction with the aim to combat modern slavery. If an enslaved migrant who was made irregular by the traffickers or who doesn't have a passport because they, it was taken away from them, risks being incarcerated in an immigration detention center and deported back to, the, uh, to, the, to a country where they might be at risk from the traffickers, how likely are they to come forward to the authorities? It is also much easier for an immigration official to process a migrant as irregular, especially in an environment where this policy is made a priority, than to start a complicated process of identification through the national referral mechanism for victims of modern slavery. There are many people in immigration removal centers who shouldn't be there because they are victims of trafficking, but who have not been identified. Immigration legislation can contribute to creating an environment where enslaved migrants are further vulnerable to exploitation or make it more difficult for them to come out of that situation. Soon after the passage of the Modern Slavery Act, the government also introduced criminal offence of illegal working. This is again in direct contradiction to the efforts to stop slavery. Immigration status, and this is very well known, is one of the means used by exploiters to coerce migrants. Where a migrant is made irregular by their trafficker or targeted because of their lack of status in the first place, they are easy to coerce into compliance through the threat of denunciation to the authorities. They are in a Kafka situation where escaping from exploitation might lead them to be treated as criminals rather than victims or witnesses. Visa regimes in particular uh, can be problematic because many of the many of many visas actually bind vulnerable workers to their employers or sponsors and that does help instill a situation of dependency and imbalance of power and that we know contributes to the risk of exploitation the plight of overseas domestic workers in the uk is the prime example of how poorly designed immigration regulation led to de facto legalization of exploitation Overseas domestic workers came to the UK, usually with their employer on a short-term visa. That visa effectively binds them to their employer. In the past, it was found that visa that tied worker to an employer increased the risk of exploitation. This led to a change in the visa regime in 2012, and workers were able to leave an exploitative employer uh, and find another without uh, losing their immigration status. Sorry, this was the situation before 2012. Now, this was reversed in 2012. Since then, domestic workers are trapped in a situation that gives them the choice of either remaining in exploitation or potentially facing deportation as irregular migrants. Under the current regime, domestic workers who come to the UK uh, come on a six-month non-renewable visa. While in theory, they may change their employer, they can only do that within those six months. In reality, that's pretty much impossible for a worker to run away from exploitation, seek support, sometimes necessary medical treatment for abuse, and then find a new non-exploitative employer. Independent inquiries, charity campaigns, and groups of domestic workers all documented that this contributes to forced labor. Despite that, the situation remains unchanged and domestic workers suffer abuse behind closed doors, often in affluent parts of our capital. Labour market regulation and labour market enforcement are the other policy areas to look at when trying to understand the risk of modern slavery. There is a clear link between violation of labour laws and forced labour. Most exploitation occurs on a continuum that spans between decent work, the sort of work we would all like to have, and the other extreme, forced labour. Any situation in between these two extremes represents some degree of labour law violation. Now, if breaking of labour law, or some, some might say lesser exploitation, gets unpunished, it is likely to deteriorate into forced labour. It follows that if rights of workers are properly enforced, this can contribute to the reduction of forced labour. Unfortunately, in the UK labour market in, in the UK, labour market enforcement is fragmented, carried out by different bodies, underfunded and mainly reactive. Consequently, 
poor practices often go unpunished. If we take the example of agency working, which is one of the sections of the labor market most prone to pra uh, poor practice, we can see that sanctions against rogues are rare. The Employment Agency Standard Inspectorate um, lists the number of people who are currently prohibited from running an employment agency business. That list has only four entries. Well before the, pan well before the pandemic, the government has announced a reform to the system of labour market enforcement, including a plan to create a single enforcement body that would bring together several of the now independently operating agencies. Simplifying the system through creating a properly resourced body could make a difference, especially if it worked directly with stakeholders in civil society, trade unions and other worker organisations. The employment bill that is expected to create the body is yet to be introduced by the government, and no timetable has been given for this thus far. Matthew Taylor, who was the Director of Labour Market Enforcement, under whose auspices the single enforcement body should be created, raised his concerns in a, an article in Financial Times this Jan, uh, January about the government's commitment to workers' rights and the future of the labour market enforcement strategy. Taylor submitted his draft strategy to the government before he departed from his post. It apparently covers issues, and I quote from the Financial Times piece, such as the risk of economic pressures that lead employers to cut corners on workers' rights and the potential for a new immigration regime to, deal, uh, to, deal to, a, uh, to lead to a surge in the exploitation of foreign workers. Addressing these issues should be a priority of the government in the coming months as a way to prevent modern slavery. I've spoken a lot about challenges and barriers that need to be removed on the journey to eradication of modern slavery. Before I discuss the most recent additions to the list, Brexit and COVID-19, I want to briefly talk about slavery in supply chains. Businesses, after all, are the key stakeholders whose behaviour can contribute to the solution, but is also often part of the problem. One of the most significant contributions of the Modern Slavery Act in my opinion, was the inclusion of the Transparency in Supply Chains Clause. This clause requires businesses, as well as large, large charities and now local authorities, with a turnover of 36 million or more, to publicly report every year what are they doing to address the risk of slavery in their supply chains. While the law is quite light touch, and despite its deficiencies, I see that provision was a turning point. It has led to an emergence of awareness, open debates and engagement by many companies that would have not previously talked about modern slavery or human rights. It was a starting point for engagement that, had had, that has had ripple effects globally. I had conversations with coconut producers in Myanmar, um, tea producers in Sudan, as well as clothing brands and law firms in the UK. Other countries followed suit. Australia introduced its own law, building on the UK provision, but strengthening it. Canada has been considering similar legislation. The EU proposal for the mandatory human rights due diligence law has, their, has its origin in a campaign success here in the UK. The UK has set in motion an international debate about regulation that focuses on business behaviour in relation to exploitation in supply chains. However, it now looks to lag behind others. Recent review of the Modern Slavery Act by Business and Human Rights Resource Centre showed that the overall impact of the disclosure legislation on changes in behaviour and practices has been limited. It concluded that it has failed in its stated intentions, with 40% of companies covered by the law having never submitted a report on supply chains and not a single company facing repercussions for non-compliance. We knew before the passage of the Modern Slavery Act that there was a better alternative that had a precedent in the UK law, the Bribery Act. It was proposed that a due diligence law modelled on it could hold companies accountable if they failed to prevent human rights impacts, not just forced labour, wherever they occur. This would have had a sub significant preventative effect as regards modern slavery. At that time, there was no political appetite to go as far as that, and the resultant modern slavery provision uh, was, uh, and the resultant um, 
transparency in supply chains provision was a compromise that campaigners hoped to build on and expected to see the leadership from the government on. However, now the UK may be losing its initial lead in this area. France has introduced a duty of vigilance law, which requires companies to prepare a preventative plan on human rights impacts. Germany and the Netherlands are moving to introduce mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, and the EU will also legislate in this area. It is difficult to imagine how the UK can keep its ambition of being a world leader in tackling modern slavery without reforming the supply chain legislation. Which brings me to my final point. What do COVID-19 and Brexit mean for modern slavery in the UK? Shocks create conditions in which exploitation thrives. The economic and political fallout of crises means more vulnerable people and multiple serious issues that compete for limited resources. Restarting economies often leads to deregulation and championing growth over protection of workers' rights. These are ideal conditions for modern slavery to thrive. I've seen the rise of trafficking from countries of Central and Eastern Europe when their economies collapsed in the 1990s following the fall of the Berlin Wall. I've seen the situation in the Balkans after the Yugoslav War that made the region a hotspot for human trafficking. What the UK is facing now may not be an aftermath of a war, but a similar seismic shift away from the way this society lived for four decades. The disentanglement from the EU trading bloc and legislative system does remind me of the process that the Central and Eastern European countries went through when they had to transform their economies and legal systems to become liberal democracies. In Central and Eastern Europe, the process took over a decade and livelihoods of many have suffered during that time. And many also became victims of trafficking in wealthier European countries. What the UK is facing now on its journey to eradication of modern slavery is the added challenge of a combined impact of the pandemic and Brexit. The economic impact is already apparent. Just how significant and long lasting, it is hard to say. But one of the consequences can be anticipated. Those already vulnerable will be more at risk of exploitation and those who previously were not vulnerable may be at risk for the first time. This has been pointed out by many, including the Center for Social Justice in its report last year, that points out that prevention will be key in addressing the risks created by the pandemic. What we already know is that the starting point was not a good one for vulnerable workers. COVID showed itself to be the great amplifier. It shone a light on low wages, exploitative conditions and disregard towards workers' rights. Sweatshops in Leicester garment manufacturing were once again in the headlines, but there were more headlines about workers' pressure to accept worse conditions and to work in unsafe environments. Those in precarious work on insecure or zero-hour contracts were most at risk of pressure as well as more at risk of contracting the disease. We have seen the rise in benefit claims and rise in unemployment which is expected to further, further increase when furlough comes to an end and as businesses deal with precarious situation and collapse, some because of the pandemic, others because of Brexit. The rise in unemployment and pressure on costs of labour carries with itself a significant risk of exploitation. One, because of the likely pressure to reduce the unemployment statistics by pushing people into any job, whether or not that job is in decent conditions. It is also likely to put more power into the hands of exploitative employers who easily threaten workers who complain with dismissal. Second, there is a risk that employers will seek cheap labour abroad, especially where there are not enough workers in the UK or where they previously relied on seasonal labour from the EU in agricultural, retail and tourism. With it come multiple risks for workers being recruited from further afield brought to the UK under restrictive visas through deceptive recruitment practices and where they are already dead bonded to their agent before they even start working here. A research by Focus on Labour Exploitation that has just come out has looked into worker experience with the seasonal workers pilot, a temporary labour migration programme that has been designed to respond to labour shortages in agriculture. That report highlights the risk of human trafficking for forced labour and finds a range of forced labour indicators, including deception about the nature of the work, degrading living conditions 
excessive dependency on employers, and lack of freedom to change employer. 62% of the workers that they surveyed reported incurring debts to travel to work, the UK to work. That report is a fresh documentation of how migration schemes can create traps that expose workers to the risk of exploitation and enslavement. Furthermore, the rise in poverty and deprivation or exacerbation of an already dire situation will put more vulnerable British children at risk through county lines exploitation something that we have seen documented in the media throughout the pandemic. I would also argue that vulnerable British nationals may be at a higher risk of trafficking in Europe because they will no longer have the same rights as other EU citizens. Cases of trafficking of British nationals may have been rare, but there have been some. Um, an example of a man trafficked for forced labour in Sweden and women trafficked for sexual exploitation in Italy. Without the possibility to easily look for work elsewhere, or to access seasonal jobs in decent conditions, such as in the winter or summer tourism industries, vulnerable British nationals might well be at risk of trafficking in Europe. I also expect Brexit will impact on the UK's ability to tackle modern slavery because we lost access to funds, learning, knowledge and criminal justice tools. UK membership in the EU enabled NGOs, policymakers and civil servants to participate in networks, working groups and projects focused on anti-trafficking in Europe. Most of these are open to participation to only to EU member states. Coming together across the EU and being enabled to do so through EU funding is absolutely crucial. Learning from good practice but also mistakes in other countries makes us better in our response. Hearing about new trends and developments helps us better prepare if similar issues arise here. Knowing personally colleagues working in the anti-trafficking field in other countries makes collaboration much easier and quicker. For example, in my previous job, um, we had a joint EU-funded project with colleagues in Ireland and the Czech Republic, which enables us to map the journey of Vietnamese people trafficked through the EU into the UK. These connections matter as much of trafficking into the UK is linked to the EU. Traffickers excel at working together across borders and so need all the stakeholders that work against trafficking. The UK government should look at ways of replacing the funding and negotiate that the UK stakeholders can continue to participate. I believe that Brexit will also, it will also impact on the UK's ability to prosecute traffickers and to collaborate on criminal justice issues. As an EU member state, we benefited from direct access to collaboration and additional resources through the Europol and Eurojust. One of these was the ability to form joint investigation teams with other EU countries. The UK was an, e was an EU country with most of these joint investigation teams on human trafficking, which we initiated and which led to a number of large-scale operations and prosecution of traffickers across several EU countries. In practical terms, this, this arrangement enables direct collaboration without having to go through a long and onerous task of mutual legal assistance requests. It also enables police officers from one country to work alongside and be embedded in teams in another country with the same powers. While the UK retains its presence and is a partner in both Europol and Eurojust, it does so as a second tier partner with fewer powers. We are no longer able to initiate joint investigation teams that we excelled in and relied on in the past. We cannot use the European arrest warrant and there are additional barriers in extradition agreements. So if the UK wants to retain its approach to tackling modern slavery, predominantly as a crime, it will need to find ways to make up for the loss of powers and access to EU resources. There are, of course, other areas of impact of Brexit which we could discuss if time allowed, such as labour and environmental standards and how they intersect with modern slavery. The past 200 and plus years have showed us that the journey from abolition to eradication is not a straightforward one and one that requires the society and those in the position of power to face some uncomfortable truths. There are more uncomfortable truths that the UK will need to counter to get closer to eradication. Despite the existing challenges, the past decade has brought about changes that we can build on. The legal framework and institutional infrastructures are there, both local and national. This can be further improved.
there is much greater awareness about modern slavery and acceptance that this is a problem in the UK, which puts us in a good position to act. Many more professionals are involved. Crucially, survivors and those with direct experience are now increasingly involved and lead efforts of emancipation. This means that with the right multi-stakeholder strategy and resourcing, strides can be made towards eradication. As we emerge from the pandemic and enter a new era of the UK outside of the EU, this is a time for the next generation of modern slavery policymaking. Policymaking that is honest about the causes of modern slavery that are linked to the systems that govern our society. Policymaking that puts the rights of those enslaved at the center and focuses on emancipation informed by first hand experience. And policymaking that understands the intersections with the UK's political economy. I would also like to see all of us more involved on the issue as citizens, holding to account our elected representatives locally and nationally and demand that they act and ask difficult questions if they fail to do so. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Clara, for taking us through the developments around modern slavery and anti trafficking in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and uh, I am now opening um, the floor uh, to questions. There's already a few that have uh, come through. We'll have about 20, 30 minutes uh, for questions. But I also wanted to remind all of those of you in the audience that you can take the floor and ask the questions yourself if you much rather uh, do that. So I'm just uh, going to start by reading some of the comments and questions that we've received uh, so far. Uh, the first one is from uh, Simon Stein, and he agrees with you in terms of um, how uh, Theresa May's uh, invention of the term modern slavery uh, operated. Uh, but looks uh, and asks um, whether we should be paying more attention as well to widespread uh, forms of forced labor such as feudal uh, debt bondage and the conflation of trafficking uh, and migration in order to justify harsher um, migration borders. Um, a position taken perhaps uh, even more uh, by the government of, uh, of Australia. And he also agrees with uh, Mike uh, Dotridge uh, in terms of the um, priority on, on enforcement rather than protection. But he asks, so do you have an up-to-date statistics about UK prosecutions? How many of those who accept forced labor or traffic people for forced labor have been prosecuted? And how many victims have been prosecuted or deported for migration offenses or for criminal acts they were forced to commit while in forced labor? Thank you, Simon, for your question. That's a very good question, Simon. And, and thank you for the extensive, extensive comment in the in the in the chat box. This is it is very strange that you can't see anybody on the screen apart from you know Lauren oh, no. and each other. So it makes <laughs> a, a very, very strange way of discussing things. But um, on your question in terms of up-to-date statistics on prosecutions, I'm afraid I don't have that number and my understanding is it's it's always very challenging to get that number because some cases that are cases of forced labor or trafficking actually do not come up as such in the in the statistics because they may be charged with uh, conspiracy charges so it's always quite difficult to get that data but there there is some there are some statistics but i don't have them at hand but happily look for these and, and, and send them to you later. When it comes to the data on people who would have been deported or who would have been who victims who would have been prosecuted, I don't think, I, I believe that data doesn't exist because the government uh, simply isn't, isn't counting that because if people are deported before they have been identified as traffic, they don't figure uh, anywhere, in, anywhere in the statistics. And that's usually the case for people who have not been identified in the first place that are subject to uh, that are subject to uh, deportation so that and I, I know I know that a lot of NGOs have been trying to find out that information and last that I checked was that this data was not available at all thank you the next question is from uh, Gary Craig uh, 
um, and he said that uh, you've talked a lot uh, about the contradictions between immigration, labor, market, and anti-slavery policy. And he says, leaving all of that aside, will you argue that the Modern Slavery Act, despite the 2019 tweaks, is fit for purpose? That is, that is a challenging question as well. I, I think it's been shown that it, there are many areas of the law that don't work. Um, but I have to say, I, I am usually not a big advocate for sort of scrapping a law and starting from scratch. Um, I, I think, I think the, the critical thing will be to get victim protection on the statute. And I think that's one of the big weaknesses of the Modern Slavery Act that it's not, um, it's not uh, guaranteed in law. I think what will also be very, very uh, important is how the UK actually engages with its international obligations going forward, because obviously a lot of, a lot of ability to keep, keep uh, tabs on it was linked to our membership in the EU, but we are still members of the Council of Europe and bound by the Council of Europe Convention. So I think the law isn't, the, the law certainly, I wouldn't call it a world beating or world leading. Um, and there are some, there are some key, key improvements, but I would worry if we were to sort of completely start from scratch what we would end up with. And I think the other thing to remember importantly is that there are other pieces of legislation in the UK, in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And I think, for example, the Scottish legislation seems to be seems to be much better in some of the areas such as protection um, and support um, than than the UK Modern Slavery Act. Just um, I'm, I'm going to take the privilege of being the chair and kind of um, follow that on with with a question myself, because you do talk at the beginning of your presentation about um, understanding the complexity of of what is happening uh, on the ground and how we can best respond to these. And then you kind of traced the ways in which all of this trafficking uh, modern slavery legislation has evolved over the last two and a half, three decades. And we kind of also marking the, the trafficking protocol 20th um, anniversary. And there's been kind of discussions around, shall we um, given all of the attention and in, the intense uh, activities around anti-slavery and anti-trafficking in the last three decades in terms of policies, um, in terms of uh, interventions, uh, in, in terms of kind of bureaucratic responses, such as, for example, national referral mechanisms, etc. But at the same time, this has gone side by side by more hostile environment to migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, uh, we've um, seen an accelerated kind of reduction in terms of uh, workers' rights uh, across the globe, uh, more informalization, more flexibilization, um, the kind of criminalization of particular uh, groups, uh, and this kind of um, how are we uh, then uh, sort of um, understanding that complexity by using this lens of modern slavery. So some uh, commentators and critiques have been maybe we should leave that modern slavery angle um, aside and step out of that box in order to kind of address those complexities that we're talking about. What is your kind of take on some of this? Um, I think it it matters what we call what we call things, and and I think I think there has been a lot of rhetoric that has spun out of creating sort of the modern slavery brand. And I think a lot of inaction has been masked behind statements and, 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 and that is problematic. Um, I think the complexities, and I think that it has also reinforced the argument of, you know, this is all about fighting crime and fighting criminals. And, and I think that's, that's extremely unhelpful because it has obscured the fact that actually a lot of what we have created and what we are creating through policies and practice actually makes the situation worse, not better, but we are not connecting the dots. And it's for me, it's always very interesting when talking to uh, organizations that work on the ground where they 
try to weigh up, especially where they work with vulnerable vulnerable workers or vulnerable migrants, um, where they're trying to weigh up whether having whether to refer them or not into the national referral me mechanism, whether it's actually more damaging for the individual to be identified as a potential victim than try to access their rights through uh, through other means. For example, sort of, you know, to, through civil challenge of their employer. So going to an employer uh, employment tribunal that doesn't have jurisdiction over um, forced labor, but actually can potentially uh, find resolutions of situations. So, and I think this is really indicative where, where people are actually hesitant about referring people into a system that is supposedly designed to protect them that very clearly shows that that system has not taken into account the real life situations of what people are facing and what that actually means means for them um, and i think that 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 one case for example can exemplify all of the challenges and all of the facts that having a system that operates completely detached from all other policies or in a, or sometimes even in contradiction with other policies can at the end of the day do more harm than good for individuals that have been uh, enslaved okay. right now next question is by uh, Trevor Barnard um, he says that the advocates of uh, Brexit and we live in a region of Britain which is uh, very much pro Brexit suggest that Brexit is working well and its success can be seen in the better vaccine program here plus substantial inflows of capital flowing into the country. Without having an opinion about whether these arguments are right, what would you say if the people supporting Brexit are right in that this increases British sovereignty and makes for a more mobile and dynamic economy? Is it that clear that modern slavery will increase and become worse as a result of Brexit? And don't we have to accept Brexit, whatever we think of it? <laughs> well, that's not a loaded question at all. Um, I think there is. I think I have set out all of the all of the potential, not quite all of them, but but the key key challenges that I think the new situation brings. And and the main worry, and this is something that has been raised by organisations well before. Uh, you know, well before uh, we have fought, we have we have entered the the current uh, current period of time, there has been calls for, from organisations that work on issues of modern slavery to actually really do a proper analysis of what the risks might be and how to respond to those risks. Um, the key the key issues will be with workers' protections. It will be with policies that might actually go in the opposite direction and the other thing and i think the, the 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 point that i made in in relation to not just the criminal justice collaboration but other collaboration is going to i think is going to have a severe impact because if we don't know what is going on elsewhere and how people are uh, how people are dealing with it we're going to be not really well prepared and i think by by moving um the uk outside of the eu we are still mo not moving the uk into a different ge geography so all the flows and all the challenges that were happening through international trafficking are still there but we've got less tools and less ability to deal with them because we are not part of certain collaborations that has enabled us to do so so just by the very virtue of the fact that we are not able to, for example, participate in these, that, in my opinion, makes us weaker to do uh, to deal with these issues. And and I certainly haven't seen any sort of detailed analysis of what does it actually mean in terms of victim protection, in terms of dealing with with potential risks to people uh, that might be faced by people, but also any any detailed analysis what it will actually mean for collaborations between countries and authorities. So I think just on that basis, I think the risk is there. Whether or not there is going to be an increase or decrease, I think that will depend on many factors, including on how we actually continue to focus on the issue um, and, and uh, identify identify uh, those that are trafficked or, or, or at risk of trafficking. But um, I think the risks are there, they have been well described, and there are significant enough that I think uh, the government should be really seriously dealing with them. But the question is, 
whether or not this is a priority at the moment, and I don't think it is. Just a reminder that if anybody would like to take the floor, you can do so and ask uh, your questions directly to Clara, rather than me reading the, the questions as they post on, on the question tab. Um, the, ne the next question is from uh, Nick uh, Evans, uh, and he asks, Wins, I understand why some of the EU NGO networks you mentioned only allow EU members to be part of the network. Does this not undermine the continent-wide nature of fighting trafficking in Europe today? So just to clarify on that, the NGOs themselves are not necessarily excluding or including others, but a lot of the networking that is enabled at the EU level is done through the EU institutions. For example, there is a, the EU civil society platform or is enabled through EU funding. And that funding is restricted only to EU member states. So, and I know that NGOs have been talking about, you know, what do we do if we still want to work with our UK partners? And the bottom line is, NGOs will probably not exclude their uh, UK partners, but they will not be able to get the funding from the EU. And for a small NGO to be able to find free money to network, but also to participate in projects in, in other countries, there isn't any free money. There isn't any additional money to do that. So just by the virtue of the fact that you can't access the funds uh, and would have to self-fund it or find other funding for it, organizations will not be able to participate. And that is going to that is that is going to put um, UK NGOs at, an, at a disadvantage. And of course, that's not just just an issue for anti-trafficking. So I think it's it's a question of you know are, are, whether other funders might step in. But there has been a lot of work that, that has been able, enabled through access to EU funding, which I don't think is being replaced with any alternative funds at the moment. Mick, Mick Wilkinson asks, um, what is your position on an amnesty for undocumented migrant workers and the taking of temporary labour provision into state-run labour exchanges? Uh, it's, it is... It is Interesting one. I think there is there is always pros and cons with with sort of a with sort of an amnesty that's you know time limited and sort of puts certainly in the workers at a particular period of time into a better position, but doesn't necessarily deal with the rights and protections for undocumented workers in in the long term. So I think you know an amnesty in principle is, is a good idea, but I think it's also important to understand what that can actually. Uh, mean for workers in in the long term. And what was the other question? Was it the seasonal? Sorry, Lorena. What was the other part of the question? The seasonal worker about taking a, a temporary labour provision into state-run labour exchanges. State-run labour exchanges. State. Yes. Okay, I'm not quite sure what. So what... A lot of state in... Oh yeah, in a labour exchange. I think the key, uh, if I understood correctly, then I think the the key thing is I don't I, I don't think there is anything in principle wrong with sort of temporary labour, um, seasonal labour exchanges as long as they enable workers to have rights. So if we have workers that are tied to an employer whose status is so restrictive and so inflexible that it effectively renders them trapped in a situation if that situation becomes exploitative without access to their rights that's problematic also if we are not able to actually to ensure that recruitment is done in a way especially in countries of origin in a way that's not deceptive that workers don't arrive with already with a massive debt that is that is that is also a challenge and that is going to be much more difficult if we you know start recruiting workers from f further afield and there is also the additional things like cost of visas you know if the worker already has to pay upfront for that visa that is then sold to them as a recruitment package very often this basically ends up being being um, a debt trap so there there is a lot of complexities and i i think it all comes down to you know what rights are the workers going to have and very often it's a disbalance there is a there is an uh, there is the economic argument you know we've got labor shortages we need to quickly uh, hire workers and find labor and um i would think that 
the concern about actually ensuring that the workers have the have the have the rights the the worker the rights that they should have as workers here are not necessarily always properly um enforced but also there isn't really much thought given to them especially if we were talking sort of seasonal demand and very very quick uh, very quick turnover in terms of uh, needs and and very quick uh, turnover very quick very quick rec recruitment campaigns so judith um Spixley, um speaks about uh, the use of the term modern slavery that you were referring at the beginning of your talk so what impact does this have in terms of uh, collaborative working? Um, it's interesting because happen. I have certainly been in, situation, in situations internationally where I was explicitly told not to use that term because that would be problematic either because of the sort of the, the context of what that term means, but also because it's simply not understood. So what we then find is there is, a, there is a particular terminology that is being used by some countries or with some funded programs. And then you are at the same time being asked, well, actually, you know, you, this, this, this particular program might be funded uh, with the headline of modern slavery. But in practical terms, you can't really use that term because it's not understood. It's, pro it's controversial. It's, you know, it's, it's not accepted in a particular context. So... I think as long as people actually understand what what terminology is the best terminology to use in in practice in a particular geography in a in a particular context, I think it's important to use that terminology rather than sort of focus on on modern slavery. And and certainly, you know, we all know that in in many languages that that term doesn't even translate properly. So it's sort of I think I think it's it's in my experience it's much less widespread in usage than uh, than it might appear from from where we sit. Mike Dotridge, um, his question: The UK seems to have adopted uh, what the Australians call an all-of-government approach to human trafficking, with the Home Office deciding, for example, on what projects are appropriate in trafficking victims' countries of origin, for example, Vietnam. Do you think this approach works? Huh. Well, I think there was a recent, I think there was a recent um, evaluation that was actually done by um, a body, a, a, a government body that, that, that was looking at, that looked precisely at that, um, at that funding that was used to fund uh, modern slavery projects. In, in countries like Vietnam. And, and I don't think the evaluation was particularly positive overall. I think it identified some good examples, uh, but I, I, if I remember correctly, I don't think that evaluation was, was, was particularly, particularly positive. So if, if that evaluation is anything to go on, I think it probably suggests that it, the approach might, might not have worked, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure Mike would have seen that evaluation. But uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's quite. I would, I would, if people are interested in detail, I would recommend that evaluation document because it goes into real detail and specifically looking at projects. And and certainly, you know, it pinpointed, for example, to to uh, projects that use cash transfers and and linked sort of anti-slavery efforts with financial packages and nutrition packages in Myanmar. Um, and that was a good example, although unfortunately, I, I think uh, a lot of the impacts might be might be lost uh, now or very soon in Myanmar. But there were some 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 good examples. Uh, but overall, I think it it found that there wasn't one consistent approach. And I think that might have been might have been a, a part of a problem as well. Fiona McTaggart asks, in view of the fact that neither the present nor the previous modern slavery commissioner will committee to empowering overseas domestic workers by giving them the right to change employers and to extend their visa, what do you think can be done to end enslavement of overseas domestic workers? I think that's, uh, yeah, I think Fiona, that's, you know, it's such a. It's. It, it. I just find that very, very upsetting. The whole. The whole situation around domestic workers, because 
the evidence is there and it's you know the it's in irrefutable evidence we've we've been talking about this for years and i in fact i i don't know what else what else can be what else can really be done uh you know other than other than just keep keep the pressure up i think there are i think there are uh, campaigns that could potentially be you know be supported i th i think it may be that you know, uh, for example, the mayor of London could look at ways of sort of tackling it as as an issue where it's related to particular uh, to particular parts of London. The local councils might also might also uh, start looking at that in terms of in terms of you know individual cases or individual approaches. But I think un un unless and until the visa is is amended, as as an issue this this will not stop and i i don't know i don't know i think maybe we need a marcus rashford type type uh, uh person to sort of headline a campaign because it seems to be going nowhere and in fact i would really be interested to hear what you think fiona could be done more because i think we've sort of it's be, everything has been tried in many ways there have been you know media has been has been onto it there have been campaigns but uh, yeah, I just I just don't I just don't know what else what else can be done. Um, Fiona, if you wanted to respond to her, you could always unmute yourself and and uh, take the floor. I'm not sure if she's doing that. Hello, I'm unmuted. That was a bit of a struggle. I mean, I asked Clara because, like you, I've been banging away at this issue for years and can't see how we can get it. And wonderful people like Marissa Begonia, who organises the Voice of Domestic Workers, have tried to be a Marcus Rashford, but she's obviously not as famous as he is, so that hasn't worked. Um, I i i'm not sure how the mayor could do something because of course the women and it's mostly women who are in this situation will run out of visas before an intervention can actually get in place and so that under national law they'd be in breach if they were still working and the present referral mechanism which expects them not to work impoverishes their families back wherever they came from so that doesn't work either and i think the only thing we can do is just keep saying that it's a tiny group of people and the only way to uh make equivalent the power of an exploitative employer and the individual worker is to allow the worker to change employers and to allow them to extend their visa. And it was a difficult persuading of Jack Straw to do that, but we succeeded and we've got to try it with the present government. Yeah, I think it is, you know, it is a struggle. And I, I think we will all continue, all of us who are involved in, in, in pushing for this. But if if it's in anybody's power to to find someone like Marcus Rashford to headline some of Marissa's campaigns, uh, that would be that would certainly be helpful in terms of getting getting the attention of the issue. Can't hear you, Lorena. I can't hear you, Lorena. I don't know if it's just me or. I think that my connection um, might be a bit weaker. Um, it's, so it's can fine. you hear me now? Okay. Right, moving on with the next question from Colin Ward. He asks, uh, 
from your knowledge and experience, where do you think police can improve that uh, will make the biggest difference? Um, he's a police officer himself. So that's why he's asking the question. There is a, a huge variety in, in the response uh, of the police to, to this issue. And I think the, the distinction tends to often be, at least in my experience, if there is that sort of a pre-planned operation, sort of a large scale uh, operation, very often that's that's well prepared in collaborations with organize with with ngos and there are specialist police officers in involved so those tend to go really well where i think there is still an ongoing challenge is with the sort of unexpected ad hoc situations where um either police officers on the street or even civilian staff that sort of ends up manning the police stations do not necessarily recognize what is modern slavery what isn't modern slavery and what should they do in those situations and just to use again an example of of domestic workers my understanding is that the problem that we have seen for the past two decades still continues where a domestic worker runs away finds a police officer or contacts a police officer and that police officer very often then contacts the employer they have run away from and sometimes the domestic worker is is returned to the situation of exploitation or it's not understood that this is a this is a situation of um potential for slavery and modern slavery and people are just turned away and say well because you've not been paid a, a wage well it's not a police matter go somewhere else so I think that there is still that mismatch between the, the, the specialism that exists within the police and sort of the ability that to, to trickle that down for people to actually understand that situations of modern slavery very often don't look like modern slavery when you first encounter either the situation or the person is, is, is telling you what has happened to them. And I think the 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 cuts with in policing and especially the cuts in community policing have have had a significant impact on understanding the sorts of issues that might be happening in communities and you know with with again going back to domestic workers i i would certainly you know i, I would i would want every single police officer in london uh, to know that they might come across a situation of domestic servitude because we know that a lot of domestic workers are exploited in in London, not exclusively, but it tends to be an issue. So I think that's that's where that's where where the gap, gap lies, and I think the gap needs to be needs to be needs to be closed between the sort of the specialism and the fact that you know this might be a situation that an ordinary police officer might come across uh, and not necessarily identify it as such, and that can mean a lot of a lot of potential challenges for for those who have taken taken the step to run away. Okay. Simon Stein would like to take the floor. So Simon, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask um, directly and make. Your Thanks so much. Oh, hi, Claro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we're compatriots, of course. Um, I. I I wanted to say I wanted to chip in a little bit on the discussion on domestic workers because it brings me to another point about the discourse in general, Clara, that I really would like to raise because I agree with everything you said except for not what you said but one of the ways you've said it. Um, so uh, you, you know that I have a particular interest in the domestic worker issues because many years ago it fell to me as the TU, TUC representative in the ILO governing body supporting Bill Brett at the time to introduce the proposal into the workers group of the ILO that we needed a new convention on domestic work, on, on decent work for domestic workers. It was the TUC that made that proposal first. And you know, and Marissa is absolutely one of the great heroes of the movement and we need uh, many, many more Marissas. But what we also need is infinitely more domestic workers bought into the trade union movement, which of course has been what Marissa has worked so hard on. And here's the thing that I want to lead on to say about the way we conduct our discourse. Um, I think we can help in a variety of ways. 
But one of the ways we can do this is I think we need to rethink about whether we should so easily use exploitation as a synonym for forced labour. Um, and I'll tell you why I say that. I don't think exploitation uh, is a moral category. I think it's an economic category. I think it de defines the essential relationship between capital and labour. You can be a, a, a Mercedes worker in Stuttgart with a fantastic collective bargaining agreement, excellent wages and occupational safety and health, wonderful provisions, great workplace, and still be exploited because Mercedes make a significant profit out of every car they sell. So my point is this, if we continue to, to use this synonym, and it is used very much, and particularly, I think, since the debate about modern slavery, which we should not use, we should talk about contemporary slavery and forced labour, because that's what the conventions use, and we shouldn't use language that is not laid down in international law. But if we continue to use exploitation when we mean forced labour, we, we undermine, in my view, and I know it's not intentional, but it's become really widespread, we undermine the recognition that there is a universal right to collective bargaining. If people are only exploited when they're in forced labour, that would imply that everybody else is getting a fair share of the wealth they've helped to generate. In which case, why do they need unions? Why do they need collective bargaining? Why do McDonald's workers, why do Uber drivers need their union? If they are only in conditions of exploitation, we're on then on that bit of the continuum of freedom and unfreedom, which falls into the category of legally defined unfreedom. So I think we should stop using exploitation as a synonym. I don't think it helps trade union recruitment. I don't think it helps the arguments for collective bargaining. We should call a spade a spade and use the language of the conventions and the definitions to define false labour. We have a legal threshold on the continuum above which we talk about work in freedom, however difficult it may be, and work in unfreedom below it. Everything on that continuum where profits extracted from labour is exploitation. Some of it is in the most wonderful conditions that nobody's going to complain about because they've got excellent, but somebody's still making a profit out of their labour. Let's stop using the synonym and start using the right language because it will make it clearer about why the why 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 all workers need unions and all unions need all workers that's what will be my argument and i'd be delighted if we could get a greater consensus on that point in the movement and help clarify i think it would help build the bridge with the trade union movement uh, and between the wider anti-slavery and anti-false labor movement and push those who conflate trafficking and migration for their venal xenophobic purposes to one side. They're using this language, they're using it improperly, we should not give them any sucker. Let's use our own and stick to the language of the internet of international law. Thanks ever so much for letting me get that off my chest. Uh, Simon. Uh, yeah. Um, no, that, I, I think that the, the, the building of bridges between, between the anti-slavery um, organizations and trade unions and, and making sure that trade unions are more part of part of the part of the part of the, uh, the coalition and collaboration is 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 a key is a key thing and I, mean, I sort of attempted to do as you know a bit of work with the ituc quite a while ago and i think there is more of that but i i think the lang language can be partly an issue now there is still going to be a challenge with your with your point around using only um, only uh, language that is defined in in law. We still have the trafficking for the purpose of labor exploitation, uh, which is used in in the in the Council of uh, Europe Convention, for example, which also doesn't quite define exploitation in the way that that you have described it. So I think there is there is an uphill struggle there. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I think I agree, and certainly I would, for example, like to see the 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 term decent work to be used much more and that's something that's very difficult to introduce in the discourse in and and there are various various different uh, modifications that are being used that i know in the uk you know there's good work there's better work but actually decent work that has been defined is not used as much as as certainly i would like it to i would like it to see so thank you very much for your for your contribution there Clara, can I just come back and say on this point of trafficking for labour exploitation, I don't think that is such a problem because it puts the two concepts together. Here you have 
a type of labour exploitation which takes place as a result of trafficking is th and is therefore under conditions of forced labour. You can have labour exploitation without trafficking and forced labour. Here it's, com it's one type of exploitation that takes place in conditions of unfreedom. And I don't think that's a problem. The problem is when we think that exploitation only takes place in those conditions. Yeah. And that's my, that's my argument. So yeah. I, think, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, but um, we do have the language in the conventions, including both the trafficking for labour exploitation. As long as we use it carefully, I think we can use it effectively. Thank you, Simon. I was just checking um, to make sure that I hadn't missed any questions. Um, and I think that we kind of um, coming to the end um, of this. Uh, but I'm just going to pose um, uh, the last question by Eleanor Smith. Um, she says, retailers often wait for government policy or brand damaging press to govern their response actions. What advice can you give to those within the retail industry to move to a more victim centric approach? Um, I think the retail industry as such should should really look hard at itself and, and the way it actually employs people or or, or engages with workers. I think the, the a, a victim centered approach for me would be an approach where there is a commitment to decent work, which sort of starts with payment of living wage and guaranteeing all workers uh, their rights. It would also start with not just recognizing, but um, working in constructive re relationship with trade unions. So actually uh, being open and promoting uni unionization of workers which would which would deal with with a lot of issues and and i think it's that th that's i think there is a challenge with if, if we talk about victim-centered approach we are assuming that that um we will only deal with situations of the extreme and once forced labor has happened and that's the only focus rather than actually thinking about well why has it happened in the first place which has to do with um uh, you know, lack of decent work and lack of worker boys, um, you know, demonization of trade unions or uh, preventing even workers. A lot of workers are, are even prevented from joining trade unions in in um, in a lot of contexts. So I think that for me would be would be the commitment that I would like to see from retailers. It's really let's let's talk about decent work. Let's talk about uh, um, mature industrial relations and addressing the disbalance between what you know the voice that worker has and um, the power of the company as a whole. Um, and and I, I and I would argue that just you know the focus simply on the extreme and on modern slavery in this context actually does very little unless it's taken uh, in the broader human rights due diligence approach it does very little to dealing with workers rights and decent work uh, in the first place Thanks very much, Clara. I think that, um, that those were all the questions that we had uh, this afternoon. Uh, before we go, um, I would like to make um, a few, uh, a couple of announcements. Um, I believe that in October, the Journal of Poverty and Social Justice is publishing a special issue on modern slavery, edited by Gary Craig and others. Uh, it includes articles on many of the issues touched on by Clara today including the collision between labor market immigration and modern slavery policy, the impact of Brexit, uh, the failure to support victims, as well as pointing to new areas of modern slavery research, including social care, rural slavery, and faith-based um, responses. Uh, also, um, to all of those um, here, I would like to also uh, bring your attention to our two next uh, webinars. The first will be on the 22nd of April, where Dr. Laura Sandy, senior lecturer in the history of slavery and co-director of the Center for the Study of International Slavery at the University of Liverpool, will be speaking about slave stealing in American history. So that's the 22nd of April at 4 p.m.
And then the next one will be May, uh, where Dr. Jelme Bors, uh, lecturing global history at the University of Glasgow, will be talking about Angola in the global uh, coffee economy. Uh, so that will be on the 20th of uh, May at uh, 4 p.m. So now um, all I have to do uh, is to thank Clara once again uh, for this afternoon, uh, for her talk, for taking us through the trajectory uh, in terms of policy and practice around anti-slavery and anti-trafficking in the UK and internationally, and to all of those uh, in the audience as well for your questions and uh, for your contributions. Uh, so once again, thank you, and I hope that you join us next time again. Good evening, everyone.